Esri Dax is a member of the House of Martok. Keiko O'Brien whipped up some crab rolls for Bashir. And Colonel Kira does her best Luaran impression. Hello, everybody, <laughs> and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk. Today, we're doing a review of Deep Space Nine Season 7, Episode 22 already, entitled Tacking into the Wind, written by Ronald D. Moore, directed by Michael Vehar. This was May 12th, 1999. Where were you? We have a very special guest today, Luaren herself, Kitty Swink. Hi. Hello, hello, Yay. hello. Awesome. We've been waiting 173 episodes. <laughs> or is it 170? Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, no. 22 of season seven. That's what I got. <laughs> well, right. you also got, and we can talk about this a little bit later, but you also got season two, a, a season two episode. What was that? It was like season two, episode nine or 10, I think. Yep. Sanctuary. There it is. Sanctuary. Anyway, what were you saying, Sirach? Uh I I was so happy when I saw you on the screen. Uh, right away, I just lit up like, hey, wait a minute, that's Kitty. We know her. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm one of your aunts, basically, Sirach. You know, <laughs> you are, you are, and you know, for people that don't know how special and wonderful you are, let me elaborate. Um, Kitty is one of the sweetest people I've ever met. I have never heard anyone say anything bad about her as long as I've been <laughs> around the business. And um, I think you have a heart of gold. Um, Armin is an amazing guy, but uh, even There's he has there. to live in your shadow. <laughs> even he has to live in your shadow because you are so amazing, Kitty. Uh, my mom loves you dearly. We all love you so much. Oh. And You've been there for uh, so many people just as a, a real nurturing and caring person in your life. So I want to say that to you directly so people understand, you know, where I'm coming from when I when I see you and how I feel about you. Oh, I feel that way about you. You're part of my family. You always will be. You've always treated me like that. And I think that's one of the, the great qualities that you have is is that you are so nurturing and you're so loving and um care caring and compassionate um which is kind of the exact opposite of the character you're playing <laughs> what yeah. a segue there it is what a professional you create an evil bitch is what you're trying to say <laughs> yes 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 um uh, the vorta as we know are you know they they're not friendly and they're cold blooded, and I I think that's such a contrast from who you are. So it was so it was so fun to watch, watch that. Mm -hmm. I, the day I went into audition, I ran into Jeff Armin, and I ran into Jeff Combs. I can't even remember where. And I I said, Jeff, you're the famous Forda. What would he have? Give me a hint. He said, Well, be obsequious. Hmm. And then I, I, every once in a while, I'll do this with your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> You may notice that a couple of times during the scene, I like pop my eyes up. Yeah. Because <laughs> you said it'll freak people out. I said, okay. And I got the job. There you go. So mm -hmm. I was, and then when, when, um, <laughs> when, when Kara did her Vorta, her Lawaran version, Armin said, oh, she's not as evil as you. <laughs> <She's> like, <laughs> but not as evil. Mm -mm. No, she's not. She's, she was way too nice. I think. She gave a greeting or something. You were not mm -hmm. giving out greetings. <laughs> and you know, uh, everybody at home, if you're like me and we're like, wait, obsequious, that was middle school, but I don't remember what it means. I got your back. I looked it up. Okay. Obedient or attentive to an excessive or servile degree. That is a, that is a, that is a that's very a Wayun thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's perfect. And I was watching you and trying to figure what you were pulling from uh, to play this character, because we've seen a lot of Vorta and they do have kind of a common thread, but they're all very different from one another still. And you clearly played that, like you were a Vorta. It was clear you were playing a Vorta, but mm -hmm. you were your own Vorta. You weren't just doing a, 
Jeffrey Combs impression because he's been in 20 episodes. You said, okay, I got it. I understand the kind of character he played. And here's my version of that. Can you tell us a bit, if you remember what that process was like, were, were you deliberately trying to create your own character? Or is that just something that happens naturally when you just start performing? I just think you always, a, a, actors, if they're smart, bring them, themselves to the party. That's how I describe it. You always walk in the door with some part of yourself. And um, in my life as a, an actor, but also as a union activist, as a civil rights and uh, feminist, I have often had to put my ego in my sneaker to get what I wanted. <laughs> and um, so I thought, well, she's going to put her ego in her sneaker to get what she wants. And so that's what I tried to do. I tried to find a way to make myself a Vorta instead of make a Vorta myself. I think that's mm -hmm. what I, does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's true whether I'm playing a Bajoran or a Vorta or a, a Russian uh, countess or a southern um, uh, poor a working class person what you know what you bring yourself to the party that's just but it, that's the process of being an actor yeah did somebody say Bajoran there you are as <laughs> yeah. Mr. Rosan I think it was yeah. uh, oh, in no, bitch by the way I just would like to say that. <laughs> <laughs> wow uh I remember this, this was right. So this was season two, episode 10, so long ago. And then we had to wait five more seasons <laughs> to see you again. But I remember you nailed this as well. Were you kind of auditioning over and over again for, for Star Trek? Were you trying to get in or did you think, ah, oh, that was my, that was my episode. That was my thing. Because a lot of start, a lot of actors that even don't know anything about Star Trek I remember this a long time ago in like a, a theater class or an acting class. There were a bunch of actors talking, you know, giving us advice and notes. And they all said, Star Trek is like a rite of passage. Like they're like, you're, eventually you're going to get in a Star Trek audition or you're going to get a Star Trek role or something like that. Did you feel like you were going to get a second episode at some point or was that it? I don't, it didn't occur to me. And then I got, then I got the call to come in and I, I went in, I mean, I usually play, oh, I'm sorry, my leave me alone phone. I, um, <laughs> shut up. I, uh, I usually play doctors and lawyers and judges and stuff on television. Mm -hmm. So, or did for a long time. I actually started my television career play by playing a hooker on a, I was a hooker on a soap opera for a while. Um, okay. Uh, it was an entirely different part of my life. <laughs> um, they, they, so uh, it didn't occur to me much about Star Trek, except Armin was there every day and I would come visit the set. And if I was shooting something on the Paramount lot, um, Sirach will tell you that I always come by for a visit. Um, so that was nice. But I, it, it wasn't my thing. I did, there was one part I, I wanted to be Armin's fiance at the, the, the Klingon, but I, I and I did read for Rilke. that. But yeah, Rilke. but ah. they hired somebody who was really great and it made perfect sense. And um, although the Klingons are quite tall, which I am, they also tend to not be scrawny, which I am. So mm. <laughs> perfect sense. I would not have cast uh, a whip. I wouldn't say scrawny, I would say petite, <laughs> but uh, you know. <laughs> Um, oh, come on, Johnny, you yes, know it. <laughs> in great shape, in slim and slender. Um, I, what was your feeling like uh, watching this episode after all of these years? It, it was, was it, going. Yeah. Well, well, because I don't, I don't enter until over halfway through the episode. So what I thought was fascinating was how many wonderful guest stars there were and how many series regulars gave really good performances in this um in this particular episode there's just one sort of stunning scene after another of excellent acting like nikki does yeah. a scene with um with michael that just was like oh my god and and michael was genuinely funny some of the time and uh all of the uh, all of the Klingons were on fire, I thought. And mm -hmm. it, it just was really fun to watch. That's what I thought watching the episode. And then I came on and um, 
I'm in a sea of people who are friends of mine in that scene. It, you know, Andy Robbins is one of our closest friends. He's probably directed me on stage more than any other director, except really another. Yeah, because we were part of the Matrix Theater Company together, and and then we were, we, you know, we worked around uh, the country, and and uh, J- John Vickery. Well, I can never say his name unless I say John Vickery was there, and <laughs> uh, I know. Because when I first met him, he was, you know, sort of the young leading man of the New York theater scene. And so he was always quite grand. And Casey, who I've I've played his wife in a movie of the week, we played husband and wife lawyers. What a surprise. And so um, it was fun. I was was surrounded by people that I loved. So that I remembered what a a splendid day it was and that we ended at three o'clock in the morning and I still had to get out of my Porta. Makeup. Oh my! Do you remember what day of the week it was? I hope it wasn't a Friday, a Friday day. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember what day it was. That's a long time ago. Um, <laughs> I, I, I thought it was clever that the the way Ronald Moore wrote it, it was that the founder that comes in that you acknowledge. And by the way, one of the things I thought you did exceptionally well as your portrayal of the Vorta was the balance between the superiority that they resonate and yep. also the subservience to the founders <laughs> that they resonate. Obsequiousness. Right? Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> yes, the obsequiousness of it. Of course. So the balance there. And I think I thought that's that's the Vorta right there. I, I thought you really um, captured that spirit of, of, of how they balance and navigate through that. But uh, the, as far as the writing, it, I thought it was clever for Odo to pretend to be one of the founders and um, come into the room in that moment. And as I was watching that scene, I was I was thinking of of Renee, and you know, you you're having the chance to work with all of the people, like you said, that are your yeah. friends, but yet Armin isn't in this episode at all, and so you didn't really work with him. And I thought that was also kind of uh, funny that you're you're set, scheduled to be on the set on days that he's basically not in this episode was that by design kitty Did, was that in your contract <laughs> we were trying to keep um armin and i worked together a lot but never on star trek isn't that interesting yeah, I, yeah. i'm trying to think uh, i was a recurring character on one show where he came to do an episode where we were both working the same day but not on the you know, not in the same scene. It, we just, where we are sort of at home, we never seem to work together, mm-hmm. except at TS, um, which is the theater that I used to be the artistic director of. Um, mm-hmm. We sometimes work together, which is divine. I love working with him. He's the best. Who doesn't? God, what an angel. Yeah. And genius. Okay. And Sirach, I know what you were thinking, because I was thinking the same thing. When uh, Kitty's character shows up, really kind of chewing up the scenery we're really getting into it and then up she's dead and we're like wait (laughs) we were just we were just getting into this new character you know and you kind of get the feeling even though i've seen this before and i remember seeing it a long time ago but i still felt like i was being led to believe okay we're establishing this new character Ooh, this is an interesting borda oh she has her own type and 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 feel and personality and, and angle to her and then wait, that's it. And and I was expecting and feeling like there should be, you know, more of you for the next few seasons. I don't know if Sorak, you felt the same way, but it, I feel like we all kind of did when we watched it. But there are no more seasons. There was five episodes after that one. So yeah, that. But have taken it. There are new. There are new Star Trek shows, and you know you can replicate Borda. I'm just. I'm just saying. True. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, once they once they get the replicator back online, it's a little yeah. too, it's not <laughs> functioning properly right now. But um, I have to say that. Wait, I just wanted to say the one other thing is it was hard to watch Renee's character fall apart. Man, because- I thought the same thing, yeah. and it must have been so difficult for the two of you having watched that. You know, being good friends of his, but when that scene came up, you know, and we were going to talk about that a little bit on, on the second segment, but I was like, God, that must be so hard to watch. Well, you know, I, 
he was the model for how to end your life in terms of how the sort of grace with which he ended life, you know, talking to everybody every day and emailing and being funny and living every day he was alive, but then watching this deterioration on camera was tough. Yeah, it was hard. Yeah, and his, his kind of uh, character almost emulates who he is as a person in the way that yeah. he had this pride about how he wanted to go out. And um, I thought the scene between Andrew Robinson and him was like one of the best scenes in this episode. It was uh, what he says to him. Um, I don't want pity from the girl that I love, from the woman that I love. So I definitely don't want pity from you. And I was like, wow, this, that scene kind of, I was moved by it and actually watch. It's gone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> actually watching this episode, one of the things stood out to me was the, the eyes. And I think all of you in this episode from the Klingons to, uh, to your character, really expressed so much with the eyes. And I just was just really captivated with the eyes. I don't know if Mike Vahar was choosing to do more close-up work, but I mm -hmm. felt like he was capturing a lot of the, the emotions in the eyes in this episode. There were a lot of close-ups. Weren't there? It was fascinating how many close-ups mm -hmm. there were. And I just think if you're under all that stuff, the thing that you can use is your eye. I mean, if the eyes are the windows to your soul, in this case, that's the only window you've got. So I think we were all using that a lot. I mean, I, I purposely used it a lot, partially because of Jeff's funny comment, but also because it just worked with that. It works. Also, I had blue eyes, which is how to have purple blue eyes when you go through life with green eyes is kind of a trip. You become entranced with them. But yeah, it was. And Ron wrote a script that sort of begged for people to come in close. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic script. He really wrote a great script. Yeah. yeah. He always yeah. does, doesn't he? We're always singing that guy's praises. He's unbelievable. Yeah, he's 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 magic and he's magic for actors. And I'm sure you felt that way when you did a script too, Sarah, but you just could kind of fall into them. They they, they allow you to be human no matter what sort of alien form you're taking, he demands that you be human. And I think you're right. The eyes do it. Yeah. Yeah. And his ability to capture what he wants to say with the language. I think his words are just beautiful. Um, the dialogue that he comes up with is just, is, is just fabulous. Um, what was, now this is season seven. What was the feeling like in the, uh, in the household um, now that you're seven seasons in 22 episodes it's all wrapping up was it was it like okay this is taking its toll on our uh, family and the work that has been put in has been exhaustive or uh, was it so was there like a celebration of we get to finally unwind a little bit or was there a sadness that this thing is ending how, how did you kind of approach it as a household I think it was all those things it was all those things. Armin was doing Buffy at the same time. And I was doing a show called Total Security. So we were both working. Armin was sometimes working around the clock. And I was um, uh, uh, did some episodes of Total Security, but I was trailing the directors. So neither of us were ever home. So it was nice at the end of that to have that breathing room to see each other again. We have a long, 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 long marriage. So even at that point, it had been a long marriage. But um, I, we probably have been married 20 years at that, well, over 20 years at that point. So mm. um, I no, 18 years. We've been married 18 years at that point. I, I, but I also think you're leaving your friends. You're not going to, you know, we saw you guys all the time. And then we didn't see you all the time except Renee uh, and Dorney. Um, but uh, it was hard. It mm. was hard to let that go, I think. But it was also, what's the new adventure? What's the new adventure? Well, Kitty, so you played a Bajoran and you played yeah. a Forda, which are two very different alien types. 
let's say Star Trek Picard calls you or uh, an animated show like Lower Decks and they said, we want to have you back. What kind of alien would you want to be? Whatever alien they want me to be, I'm happy to be. <laughs> and they say, but no human. We want, we like the way you do aliens. <laughs> any kind of, <laughs> any kind of alien. <laughs> well, I'm obviously not going to be a Ferengi because as we have already just decided. Way I'm too tall. <laughs> so I'm strong, but I'm still not that short. So, uh, I, you know, whatever comes up. I, there's part of me that would like to be a Borg just because there's something mm. Fascinating about that kind of. I'm so not regimented that it would be fascinating to me to be part of the collective. Um, I love being a Borda. I like being a Bajoran. I'd like to be sort of anything. I think it's just interesting to explore humanity in whatever form it takes. And that's what these characters do. I did one of the games or a, like a bazillion years ago, and I played a couple of different aliens and it was really fun to switch back and forth that's yeah i saw that actually uh that you're i saw that on your the one ID. of the star trek games yeah yeah uh, she yeah. played a few different characters though right yeah and and paul lighting who was in the booth right before me he's the one who did i i don't know if it was deep space nine he did he did one or two of the other shows anyway and he was in the booth right before me and he was he, they asked his first character up was a, a Borda and they said, and the director who knows us said, do you know anything about Borda? I went, oh yeah. So, <laughs> Yeah. It says here you did a, uh, did the voice for a Bajoran officer. Okay. That checks out a Vorta and also a character named Kijana. But I don't know. It doesn't say what that is, but that's three very different uh, character types. One would assume. I'm a character actor. That's what we do. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I mean, that's what you do. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. Yeah. Especially because Star Trek has got a lot of theater actors traditionally. And theater actors are allowed to be more mutable than other people. We get to shift and switch and be other, you know, in television today, they want you to be who they think you are. Not necessarily who you are, but who they think you are. So it's more fun to get to be a lot of things. Like I'm looking forward to Sirach playing. Hmm, what am I looking for? <laughs> I want him to be a tall bullion. Yeah. I want to see him in Star Trek. Blue bisected head with that oh, ridge yeah. right there. Nice yeah. barber bullion. Uh, Kitty, were you, when you guys... I mean, were you curious in reading all the scripts during the filming of the show? I mean, I know you were always on the set and I would see you all the time, but were you also like following the story, keeping track of what was going on? And you mentioned auditioning for Grilka. And I mean, were you reading scripts and like kind of up, up to date with the storyline? By the time the scripts came out, you guys had already cast them. So I didn't do it that way. I was definitely running lines. Um, mm -hmm. Armin, so I was reading a lot of it because I was running lines. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what you do when you're a spouse is you run a lot of lines. Teamwork. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it depends on how busy I was. If I was really busy, I wasn't reading scripts. If I wasn't busy, I, I read scripts. I like to I, I like to read scripts because it, it tells you about craft. There's so much mm -hmm. to learn about craft by watching uh, a DP and his gaffer light a set or reading a script or um, running lines. Just, there's so many ways to learn about what we do. And so I would dive in when I had time. But as you know, I'm kind of always ridiculously busy. So. Kitty, uh, <laughs> we only have a couple minutes left with you. And by the way, we totally appreciate you jumping in with us because you are always so busy. So we really appreciate that. But I want to hear a little bit more about you reading scripts. Do you remember anything specifically at all, or even generally at all, from just reading the various snippets of Star Trek scripts through the years? Was there anything that really you kind of hung on to? I, I loved the of Deep Space Nine. I, I was always sort of enthralled with the sense of social consciousness, which 
in a sort of macro level lives through all of Star Trek. But at that time, Deep Space Nine sort of had a bigger arc on sexual consciousness than I think the other shows did. And um, because way ahead of its time, it was a show that was um, telling stories over five or six episode arcs, you could really dive down deep. And instead of these bottle shows, you were diving down deep into stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was impressive. I remember Armin reading the episode um, Far Beyond the Stars and handing it to me and saying, you have to read this. This is extraordinary. And reading that, I, um, you know, I, I probably a lot of people don't know this, but Sirach knows this about me that I have been involved in politics all of my life in some way or another. I was a vice president of our union. I, um, mm -hmm. I, I helped women walk into clinics, uh, into abortion clinics uh, 25 years ago when Operation Rescue was blockading clinics and killing doctors. And, and um, so those kind of, those, those kind of big issues about who people are and what they're allowed to be or not allowed to be by their society thrilled me. And I thought Deep Space Nine, I would follow it heavily because of how informed it was about that. And, and I remember um, Avery and I talking um, early on in the show and him having a real sense of, I have an obligation here to make stories about what I think is right. And I, and I appreciated that. So yeah. Yeah. That's what I remember. That's mm. what I remember. It's very yeah. Um, um, I know we don't have much time, but there's so much that you've covered in your life, um, your battles with your own um, cancer and your surviving. And, um, you know, you mentioned being uh, vice president of the Screen Actors Guild and so many things that you've done. But um, I want to thank you for, you know, being there for me when Aaron Eisenberg passed away. I remember how uh, your energy was comforting for me in those moments at the funeral and uh, the hugs that you gave me kind of breathed a little bit of life and uh, hope for me back into my life. So I want to thank you for that as well. Thank you. I, I just, I remember thinking, I don't see Sirach. I think I bet he's I bet he's downstairs and coming to find you. And I'm so glad I did. It's a special it's a special moment I'll hold on to for the rest of my life. For both of us, I think. Me as well. Right. I'm gonna get cool. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say thank you for that. It was that was big and I, I definitely needed that uh that encouragement and uh uplifting that you gave me and the love that you shared with me. So Kitty, you're always amazing. You've always been consistently amazing. You are a wonderful human being. Uh, Except if I have to love you. that I'm a bitch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, that's <laughs> acting. That's that's really good acting because there's <laughs> there's none of that in you. Um, and so we just really just appreciate you being here and sharing your story with us. Um, I wish we could have had you many times on the show. They didn't. They underutilized yeah. your gifts. Thank you. Um, but Thank you. you know, I'm glad that they did uh, get the chance to see you here wow. in this episode towards mm -hmm. the end of the show, kind of they're bringing out the best for last. And I'm glad that they uh, included you as part of that. Well, you're flattering, but thank you. Thank you very much. I just, he means it. He doesn't flatter me. So I, Kenny, I, he means I, it. I only <laughs> say what, what it is. <laughs> That's how you know. Um, oh. Well, Kitty, yeah, thank you so much for thank taking you. time out of your busy schedule. We truly appreciate you, all the great stories and uh, everything you've meant to the Star Trek family for decades. Um, okay. It feels like you were just so much more a part of Deep Space Nine just because you really were behind the scenes so much more a part of Deep Space Nine. We saw you in two yeah. episodes, but it feels like Kitty is like yeah. an integral part of the family, right? Well, yeah, was... yeah, we, yeah, we've had other people come in here and talk about the the readings that they did at your house with yeah. you there, and um, so I mean, your imprint is all over this show. It's obviously <laughs> with Armin and and you know reading opposite with him and going on the journey of Quark with him, 
Um, but you're all, your imprint is all over the show. Your conversations with me, your conversations with Avery, you're impacted with all of us on the cast and the relationships that you had prior. Um, so, you know, even though there's only a couple of episodes in which we can physically see you, your, your fingerprints are all over yeah. every episode. Yeah, you know, uh, Jeff Combs told us that they'd be running lines and you'd walk in from the hall and say, no, give me more. That that doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't say that. that <laughs> but he was thinking it. No. Uh, not... <laughs> yes, although we do spend a lot. Jeff just calls out of the blue and the conversation's going forever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. We're all family. What can I tell you? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being a part of our family as well, Kitty. We really appreciate you. Um, everybody stick around. We've got another segment uh, to hit next, but not with Kitty. So make sure you go fo uh, follow her on Twitter. Uh, she's going to keep you very informed. Lots of great stuff there <laughs> on the Twitterverse, uh, Kitty's Twitter, that is. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Kitty. Really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be right back, everybody. Believe that. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello. Hello. Man, oh, man, we are having way too much fun. And we are talking about Deep Space Nine, season seven, episode 22, Tacking into the Wind. That means, you guessed it, there are three Deep Space Nine episodes after this one. Sad and scary and exciting. Here are the... Trivioids of the day, coming fast and furious. An explosion began at the intercooler matrix of a Jem'Hadar ship. Garrick sneaks up on Odo. Odo doesn't want Kira's pity. Julian Bashir has pulled four all-nighters in a row. Julian Bashir is not going to pull a rabbit out of his med kit, which I thought was cute. Martok yeah. was outnumbered six to one by the Dominion at Avenal Seven. Those of us that live in California know that there's a city called Avenal in the uh, Central Valley that smells like cow poop. Okay. Like Koalinga. Anyway, um, where was I? I got lost in poop joke talk. Avenal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> General Martok is in critical condition in the Rotaran sick bay. Worf is beginning to sound like a Romulan. Ooh, fighting words. The Dominion has succeeded in finding Damar's family. Esri Dax is a member of the House of Martok. Keiko O'Brien whipped up some crab rolls for Julian Bashir. And Colonel Kira does her best Luaran impression. So much good stuff in this episode, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, just a lot of good stuff in this episode. I thought mm -hmm. this episode was laced with some really amazing. Something good. Yeah, some scenes were <laughs> just, they were just boiling up with good scenes and nice pairings. Um, just love the pairings. Uh, one of them was Galron and Cisco. I thought they had a really great scene. Where Galron totally. was just giving him the big eyes. The eyes the were happening. He was giving <laughs> himself. <laughs> he was giving him, he was giving Cisco the full big eyes. And, and the contrast something. too, because you've got Cisco not giving the big eyes back, just staying cool, calm, collective. But behind the yeah. eyes, you can see that it's simmering, that he's concerned, that he's upset, that he's ready to fight. But yes. his eyes are just keeping cool, saying... That's all right, cool. Galron. You just relax, man. Galron yeah, had a great doing. line. He said, that's one of the things I like about you, Captain, your loyalty to your friends. I thought that was a great line. And then Cisco came back at him, but it was a great line. And he, Cisco said, yeah, it's not just loyalty. And I agree. That was maybe the best moment in the episode because for me, it was just, it was a good line, but it was delivered so well in that on the surface, it's it's almost Cardassian in nature or Romulan because Galron is saying something that on the surface is a compliment. That's what I like about you, compliment. Loyalty to friends, compliment, right? But the way yep. he delivers it, and I don't know if the director, Michael Vehar, told him this or if he read it in the script, but somebody told him, or this is what was conveyed, 
I'm not complimenting you. I'm insulting you. I'm saying you are wrong and you're only doing this out of loyalty, you know? And it's a weakness of your character. Yes. That's how he was trying to, he was portraying him. Like that's a weakness of yours, a flaw of yours. It was was, dripping with a jab. It was just, oh, yeah, the sarcasm. It was just, it was just amazing. It was very well delivered by uh, Bob Mm O'Reilly. I thought he just delivered the line fantastically. He actually played the very, a very good villain in this episode. Well, villain in which, you know, he's on the right on the cusp of that gray area of just losing it as a dictator or whatever, whatever it is, um, chancellor. Um, But he's on the edge of losing it. And I love the moment also with Cisco and Worf when Cisco tells Worf, do whatever it takes, Mr. Worf. Like, I don't even care what you got to do, man. (laughs) (laughs) Because I'll tell you, if Captain Picard says, do whatever it takes, it doesn't mean do whatever it takes. He's like, within reason. When Cisco says, do whatever it takes, he's like, you heard me. <laughs> yeah. And so as soon as he said that, I was like, Galron is dead. I, like, inst- <laughs> instantly, I was like, that's like the mob putting a hit out on somebody. That's like when the, bo- the godfather says, uh, I need you to take care of this problem for me. You already know what it means. It's he's, it's yeah. over. So I was like, "Oh, Gal Ron, you're dead." Yeah. Um, but great, great moments. I thought Casey Biggs. I'm I'm so impressed by his uh, his acting and his portrayal as Demar. Mm-hmm. When when he comes up to Kira and he stands up to her and he says to her in the beginning, um, uh, she says, "I think you need to do something about this guy over here." You know, the guy. And she and his answer was, "I am. I'm supporting him." Yeah. And I was, ugh. I thought that was like, it was classic. You know, it was just like, it was a good comeback. It was well delivered. Um, and then the acting, I was just blown away. I was blown away by the acting in this. Um, I thought Garrick and Odo had the best scenes in this episode uh, when Odo is kind of snuck up on by Garrick. It and really was exchange. tough for me to watch. I was not prepared for that. Uh, yeah. cause I don't remember it, you know, 20 years ago, I don't remember, it certainly didn't affect me 20 years ago when I saw it, but today when I saw it, I was just like, woof, that it, that is tough to watch. And you're, you're right. Like what you said in your earlier segment that it, f- it felt like that's how Rene lived his life, you know, similarly to Odo. Uh, I never got a chance to meet him, but by all accounts, an amazing man. Yeah, uh, and he had that pride about his own death where he didn't want it to be something that people took pity on him for, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. And I thought that was just, I mean, just the irony and the writing there and the his own life and how we've seen it played out was just remarkably kind of uh, identical in some kinds of way. So it was hard to watch that scene but it was very well acted i thought that renee gave a great performance acting through all of that makeup and almost through the shadows of the yeah of him in that bed you go only sometimes you can only see just one eye because mm-hmm. of the shadowing mm-hmm. and even through that just one eye he was really conveying a lot of to garrick like a you know don't be an asshole garrick i'm dying <laughs> <laughs> and garrick was like you know you can see he's concerned. It wasn't, uh, it was a genuine concern. And even the moment when he had that conversation with Kira, I thought that was another great scene when he's like, look, I have to tell you something. Odo is, is lying. He's, he's really hurting worse than he's giving out, letting on. And when Kira says, I know. A plus writing. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Ugh. Great twist for us. Perfect. Great twist. Um, well delivered and she says something to the extent of um uh you know if that's the if that's the thing that uh allows him to keep his dignity you know if that's how he wants to have dignity oh uh, a shed of dignity yeah a shred of dignity and i was like wow that's uh that's deep on kira's part to kind of allow him to fake fool her you know yeah i feel like that is 
really a writing clinic. I feel like that teaches us all, especially anybody that's ever wanted to do any writing, like really how to write with depth because the show doesn't need that twist. The episode doesn't need that twist, but that's the difference between good writing and great writing. Uh, they could have easily just said, oh, you know, Garrick tells her and she's like, what? And then she goes and confronts Odo and it would still be good, good scene, good, good TV, everything works. But I, I feel like that little thing of her saying, look, of course, I noticed the man I love. I, I, I'm watching his every move. Of course, I know that's a really that's a really good writing you know, twist for me. And it makes me curious if they had that little twist in mind and then they built the story around it or if they ha- were going through the story and one of them said, hey, what about if. Kira already knows and they all go, Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a great idea. And it's a chicken and egg thing. I don't know which one came first, but I just think that that's, that's what makes this show so well-written is those little details. It's really smart. Yeah. Uh, the other detail I thought was really great was the moment when the founder is talking to Wei Yun and the founder is saying, you know, Damar is becoming a real problem and we're going to have to, station all the Cardassians on outposts so that he has to kill his own people. And then Wei Yun says, what a wonderful idea. And the uh, founder says, your opinion was not solicited. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, she just and, loves tearing him uh, down. <laughs> oh God. It That's an abusive like, relationship. <laughs> yeah. She she's the Kai win of the founders, you know, out of the they they yeah. sent Kai. They sent their Kai win to be the ambassador for the founders. Um, but the way she shut him down and the other thing I think well, great writing was when she says something to the effect of, uh, Oh God, how I would long to replace this way. You let me know when the replicator is yeah. back up and running. <laughs> and then way you's kind of got this look of like, Oh, nuts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they talking about just... me, aren't they? That's me. <laughs> My days are numbers. Yes. yes. And that was a night. I mean, Obviously, they're suggesting something's going to happen in the next couple of episodes that we got left. But that was the that was the suggestion. But it was a very kind of, you know, uh, a nice moment of exposition for 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 me. And I thought once again, uh, Ron Moore just just keeps giving us drama. He's he is a master of building up drama. Right. Um, The drama between. Damar's Damar and um, Kira, you know, when 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 Garrick says you're gonna have to kill him before he kills you, That's like crazy. I was just like, I was like, oh, this is a great scene. I was just mm-hmm. eating this whole episode up. This was just like nothing but good food. And everybody at home, Damar's Damar is Gul Rusat, and then uh, because he, you know, he's kind of like Damar's Damar, and then there was yeah. a, a third one. Uh, last week played by Von Armstrong. We didn't see him this week, but that's definitely DeMar's DeMar's DeMar. Kind of a bummer we didn't get to see him again. Something with a K. I don't remember. Kester or Kestel. Kessel Run. Something like that. That's a Star Wars thing. Um, But yeah, I agree about Ronald D. Moore. I'm always surprised at the delicate moments that he knows how to write, because I expect him, you know, Battlestar Galactica dude knows how to write science fiction. He knows how to write tense scenes and powerful scenes and science fiction type scenes. But I'm always surprised when he has these really tender moments and this really sweet dialogue. I'm like, is there anything this guy can't do? That's not fair that he could just do everything. Well, even comedy. Yeah, he's it, 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 he is a master of really just getting into the details of story. So, you know, he doesn't just give you the overall, oh, she likes him and he likes her. <laughs> there's, you know, there's just so much layered stuff where it's so complicated and it's it's like you have to unpack a whole lot of things. Uh, so he had, I guess you would say he's the king of the backstory. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> Kira, I thought was in that scene that's behind you. With uh, Gol Rosat. A um, couple great lines a, there too. When she grabs him and he says, lines. he says, oh, I guess I hit a nerve. And that's a great, done. Mo, you know, 
Average writer says, got him, good, done. But then no, she says some, what, what did she say exactly? She's like, oh, I'll, this is I'll hitting sh- a nerve. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was, <laughs> no, this is it. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah i i I was like oh my god and even before just slightly before that when he comes up and he starts talking to her she says something to the effect of oh this should be good like (laughs) like, let's see let's see what you have to say right now because you're about to get yourself uh, in a (laughs) chokehold yeah she's probably thinking like which way do i want to harm him which is yes. the way that'll harm him that'll give me the most satisfaction. I'm going to go with the reverse headlock so I can whisper yeah. in his ear and just. Threaten. Yeah. It's like when your friend tries that karate move on you where they make you say uncle or like they get your wrist in a way. And it's like, they're like, you got to tap out. You're like, come on, dude. You know, it's like, let go, let go. She gets <laughs> you into that move where you're like, you just have to tap out and let go and ask her to, you know, release you. <clears throat> but no, I thought uh, Martok had a great line too in this episode, the moments between Worf and Martok, but I thought Martok's uh, his reasons for why he doesn't deserve to be chancellor are noble. In my yeah. opinion, he, he's like, I don't want the power and glory. I'm just a, uh, you know, an obedient loyal to the empire type of guy. I don't have any desire to be engrandized in some kind of way. And those are the reasons why he is the best candidate. It's actually what we should be looking for in, um, in our own political sphere. It's just somebody who doesn't want, you know, to wield a powerful position or a title around for their own engrandizement or for their own, you know, benefit more so mm-hmm. for the service the service of others. And I think those are the best leaders that we, we have ever seen are those people that are, you know, selfless and uh, dedicate their, um, their role or their occupation in the service of others. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's but why what, I'd what, like to nominate my grocer at Ralph's for city <laughs> council, man, because he, you should, boy, he was very friendly. Yeah. <laughs> No, but um, he gives a great line. He says, I'm just a man from the Catalonians, you know, a man without a drop of noble blood in his veins. Mm -hmm. And very Shakespearean. uh, It's very Shakespearean. Yeah. But it's also a reflection of what some people may feel in in, in life as far as um, aspiring to certain levels and feeling like certain things are unattainable in their life because they are not worthy. They don't have the pedigree. They don't have the background. And um, uh, those kind, that kind of mentality uh, could be limiting. It could be a limiting thing. Uh, clearly, it was in this position, in this particular incident, it was not the right uh, approach. Worf took the more aggressive kind of, you know, appropriate measures to and the insanity. Very Klingon. Yeah. But I do feel like it's something that a lot of people struggle with because they do feel like they're not deserving or less than or, you know, you know, not included or That's don't have the point. pedigree. Was not born so, within the amongst the elite, right? Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a, a noble perspective for him to feel like he was he was not deserving, but I also feel like those are the people that are the most Right. deserving which is, is kind of crazy um mm-hmm. in a lot of ways that's also uh the story of captain cisco becoming the emissary where that you know he was the perfect emissary because he wasn't a kai win that would that wanted the power that was that was you know born unto it and well i guess he kind of was but we didn't know that at the time but you know it's it's a very similar situation there and something i was just thinking about we got to run in just a second here we'll talk way more about it in the free for all in a second guys but another thing i was thinking was three characters died today we had the new vorta that died uh luaren right we had uh we Dukat's had Dukat. 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 demars demar right demars demar uh, yeah. Rus- <laughs> gul rusat and um Who's the third one? Galrod. Galrod. Galrod, the big one. Yeah. 
So three characters died. That's that tell that that kind of stuff is what tells you you're nearing the end of a series. You know, when people yeah. start going. Yeah. Um, uh, also, really quickly, I just mm-hmm. want to mention really quickly the other scene that I thought was uh, on par with any other good scene there is. And it was the moment when Damar loses his family or he finds out that he, his so family good. had been killed. And and Kira catching herself for making that smug comment that she couldn't resist in the moment. Um, and I feel like I've been there before. I was just going to say that. We've all been there. Where yeah, I've been there before. You're like, because- ah, that joke. That joke doesn't, doesn't, it didn't come out the way I, but he kind of, it's like, it comes out because he kind of deserves it. However, it's not necessarily the best thing to do it, but you're like, ah, but it, it was so juicy. It was so good for the taking. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, he, he's had that coming for so long. Uh, there was, but then you realize it's too easy. That was too easy. And now I just, I, I, you know, and Kira did down. a very good job. Yeah, Kira did a, a good do- a good job of recognizing that uh, that wasn't this is not the right time. Guy just founds out he lo- loses his family. You know, you don't rub salt in the wound. It's like he's already in enough pain as it is. Right. But but Garrick gave a great comeback speech to that, which is he's more receptive now to those words just exactly. because having had that happen to him. So uh, once again, great writing by Ron Moore because such a complex scene taking place. It's only a three minute scene, but it's just so much complexities in that in those and that exchange of information. And I thought, man, Ron Moore is so good at just writing and explaining things. (laughs) You know, just just, just, writing, (laughs) just writing. The guy can write. but yeah, mm-hmm. there was just too much. There was just too many good moments. Not to mention the O'Brien uh, and Bashir things. I thought was mm-hmm. also good as well. Well, speaking of too many good moments, we got too many great people to mention right now, and uh, we'll talk more about this in a minute. And they are Homer Frizzell, Doctor Anne Marie Siegel, Eve England, out in Wales, of course, Yvette Blackman, Carmen, aka Skillet. Tim Baum, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin, Arukin, Titus Muller, Darlena Marie, John Mann, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Rex A. Wood, Anil O. Palat, Erica Strom out in the UK, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Neil Akasaka, Justine Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Fultz, Radek Orshevsky out in Southwest Poland, Henry Unger, Mai, live from Tokyo, Matt Boardman, and of course, Dr. Susan V. Gruner. Wow. Gruner. That is a cool yeah. crew. Everybody stick around. We've got the free for all coming up next, and we'll be right back on the seventh rule. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the seventh rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. And a bunch of other people. This is the free for all. And those awesome people are Anil O. Palat is here. Edward Foltz is here with a, ooh, a Wei Yun picture in his background. That is cool. I redecorated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Susan B. Gruner is hanging out with Bejor and Deep Space Nine. I was going to say Earth, but that's got to be Bejor. <laughs> Eve England is out in Wales. Wearing a Defiant shirt. Faith Howell hanging out with Deep Space Nine, of course. Melissa Longo on the other side of Deep Space Nine. They each get a pylon. Uh, <laughs> Goldu Scott Jensen is here. He just got a promotion at work, everybody. Let him know how you feel about that. Uh, ooh, Dr. Ooh. Muhammad Noor is here at Duke University. You know, because if you see those posters in the background, it means that he's at work in his office. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Boardman is here. He doesn't want us knowing what the hell's in his background right now. <laughs> he's you don't all, want to know. It's all blurred. <laughs> My math uh, lab. My is, let me guess, live from Tokyo. <laughs> uh, Tierney C. Diekman is here, looking like a rock star, of course. <laughs> Carrie Schwent is here with Gowron Eyes. That's the one right there. We love it. <laughs> and uh, Homer Frizzell is here. He did stretches so he could do lots of head shakes and head eye rolls. And 
Off to a great start. Eyebrow okay. lifts. <laughs> uh, Can you imagine Gal Ron trying to approach you at a bar and he's just yep. staring at you with this? <laughs> I think it would work. Yeah. I've been looking at you all night. Like, yeah, I can tell. <laughs> we know. We know. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, couple quick things. Number one is Jake Cisco guesses the IMDb score. <gasps> I know. Oh man, didn't do that. Um, Sounds like a horse. Nine. Solid deep space nine <laughs> on this episode right here. Nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anybody else have any guesses that doesn't already know what? I don't know, but it said ten. <laughs> that must have been Sue. <laughs> Definitely a 10. It, it's a 10. I don't want to hear anything else. I'm not, I'm turning off. The <laughs> All right, guys, no more guesses. <laughs> We're all uh, muted. It's actually an 8.7. Ah! Oh, that was going to be my guess. It's pretty good, actually. It's pretty though. close. It's pretty Very close. good Salt for IMDb. Um, yeah. I'm writing okay. a strongly worded letter to somebody on IMDb. <laughs> Here, IMDb. So we had uh, four NAMs by my count. Did y'all get them? Uh, I know Keiko uh, was in there. Uh, yes. was Keiko and Sloan. Mm. Oh, I didn't catch the Sloan. Very good. I Me mean, either. Oh, oh, Curzon oh. and Jadzia. Yeah. Right. Curzon. Curzon. Yeah. Does Kalis count? Because yep. he was nailed it. Oh, awesome. okay. Yeah. Um, Kalis, a million times. Kind of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was especially happy with the Keiko one because we haven't freaking heard from her. It feels like since the fourth season, <laughs> she's just been she's, gone. She's been busy making crab cakes. On <laughs> <laughs> the other side of the hallway. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> hanging out with all the Vulcans. Yeah. Okay. She needs to come down to Cre uh, Cisco's Creole Kitchen, and we can do mm. a Caicos yeah. crab rolls on the menu. You know, crab Caicos, mm. Caicos, crab corn. Caicos. Mm. Very nice. <laughs> all right, um, no stranger to crab cakes herself. Dr. Susan B. Gruner is here, and she's got some things to say as to why this is a ten. <laughs> It's a 10 oh. uh, for, I have too many things written down. This episode, in my humble opinion, represents why Deep Space Nine was one of the best shows ever on television. I'm mm -hmm. trying to think of what show is up to the caliber of writing and acting of Deep Space Nine. The only thing I can think of maybe is MASH. And I know I'm a lot older than everybody here, but this episode was just brilliantly written. I wrote down a bunch of adjectives that I'll get into later, but oh. there was so much. You want to talk about content. There was so much here. And it was just every little bit of it was perfection. The lighting, the music, the acting, the costumes, the everything. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, perfect. It's a 10. If this doesn't get a 10, I can't imagine what, what would get a 10. Yeah, the acting was and fantastic. Esri, Esri gets a 10. She gets a 10. Mm -hmm. I keep writing hashtag Esri all over all my, my notes. Like, <laughs> you hashtag there. with your notes. Yeah. <laughs> search it easier. Yeah, you can search it easier. Yeah, you hashtag Esri. <laughs> so what were these adjectives? Don't you don't leave us in suspense here. Okay, so this is what I the things that I felt watching this episode. Hate, love, respect, murder. That's not an adjective exactly, but a verb. Uh, vengeance, justice, justice, and compassion. Hmm. All sometimes in one 30 second mm -hmm. time increment. Just amazing. Yeah. Right. 
And the best, well, my best line, or what I thought was the best line, was when the founder asked Wayun how long before the cloning facility. <laughs> 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 Poor Wayun. That was glorious. Oh, I forget what Wayun we're on. Is it six that we're on now? Oh, it's nine. eight or nine? 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 Is it eight? Yeah. Uh, oh. No, eight, I have a question nine, mark eight, nine, next nine, to it. <laughs> All right. Uh, good stuff. Definitely a 10. Uh, we're actually on our first Ed Foltz. So, however, uh, Ed, how are you today? And what do you think about this episode in particular? I'm doing great. Thanks. And uh, really enjoyed it. A um, lot of adjectives. I can't list them necessarily. But um, <laughs> one of the things that, that stood out for me, uh, just kind of watching it, rewatching it, I haven't seen it in quite a while, uh, is just what a great job DS9 does with uh, their different races, the archetypes that Star Trek has before Deep Space Nine and then continuing on has, has built. Um, just looking at the Cardassians, uh, you know, how they're, they're, they're all about order. They're all about structure, rank. Um, and even Wayun, I think at one point says that, that they won't uh, rebel because they are all about authority. Um, and uh, just how well that they, they showed that. And then one thing I remember back, I used to have the DS9 companion. I read it so many times it fell into pieces and turned to dust. So I don't have any more. But uh, when I had it, I remember, I think it was Ron Moore talking about how um, they structured the Cardassians around like Russian literature, Dostoevsky novels or something where mm -hmm. they would just go on these long monologues like Ducat uh, does so perfectly. And um, you just, just uh, I just think, how it just kind of struck me how they refined how they refine them so well over the years. They're not just someone with a different head prosthetic, you know, they're, they're, they're personalities. They've got um, the, and the same thing with the, the Klingon story uh, with, with Galron, with Martok, how they're, you know, obviously all about honor um, battle song and, and all that. And, and, um, and just, I started thinking about how Martok is in my mind, probably the best representation of Klingon. Michael Dorn did a great job with Worf, obviously, but he was kind of atypical, raised by humans and, and all that. But um, just really, really impressed with with what they're what they've done uh, with the small details, like having the races be consistent with with uh, who they're supposed to be. But yeah, fantastic episode. I loved it. Ron Moore wrote it. And, uh, and you know, he, whatever he writes, I always love. So. All right. I can't be the only one that thinks Ed looks like Sean Kenny who played Captain Pike. Check this out, right? There's no way that's, there's not a similarity there. <laughs> no, I don't know, I'll but uh, was that, not my question for Ed was, uh, what, what is Jeffrey, what did Jeffrey Combs write on the photograph behind you? It looks like there's some caption there. Yeah, yeah, he wrote uh, The Founders are Wise and All Things. My son actually got it for uh, one of my other sons. And when I saw it, I, I, I snagged it from him and said, Dad privilege. Yeah. But so my dad my privilege. Son for his birthday ever got it. Yeah, he was, Jeffrey Combs was at a convention at our house. At our, at our house. He wasn't at our oh. house. He came a couple miles from our house a few months ago. And uh, my, yeah. it was a horror convention and my son uh, grabbed it. So, yeah, so Very it's like cool. my only uh, DS9. Uh, paraphernalia so I, I put it on the wall what Must does it say there. the founders are wise yeah founders are wise in all things and I think it says happy birthday Sam which obviously is my son not me but I might black that out and just put my name I don't know <laughs> <laughs> he must have been there because of the reanimator I mean that that yeah. was the show that put him on the movie that put him on the map absolutely yeah. all right oh that's really cool yeah let us know when you uh switch names on that that'll be cool uh okay oh. anil is here how you doing anil where are you today Good. by the way i am on the east coast of the u.s nice right. how do you um, feel <laughs> <laughs> did you love this episode <laughs> yeah this is a great episode i i really liked esri's discussion with Worf. i thought that was such a uh, is such a good point about Sort of, it, it can be made about anybody, right? Like, if, if you want something to change, you have to kind of somebody's got to do it, right? Like, you're everyone's waiting for somebody else to do it. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Worf, especially in TNG, always gets the, he's a Klingon that doesn't really know what Klingons are really like because he was raised by humans and he just knows Klingons culture from books or reading or holodecks or whatever. But now it's coming back to be something valuable because he's holding on to all these things that makes him, that makes Klingons, you know, sort of like the core of the culture, the ideals of the culture. And so he's coming in as an outsider, which has always been kind of something people have held against him. And now it's turning out that he has this perspective with the help of Esri kind of, you know, uh, pointing in the right direction. I think now it's like an asset. And he's coming in and saying, hey, wait a minute. Maybe I, I, this idealism I have, I can, you know, use it somehow. So really a good turn for Worf because, yeah, Deep Space Nine just keeps making him such a better and better character. Whereas in Next Gen, he, uh, you know, he doesn't always get to shine as a Klingon. <laughs> it's true. Raised by humans. Humans. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's good stuff. Do love those Klingons. We lost, we lost Gowron, you guys. It's a sad day. Uh, <sighs> but you know who's not sad about that? is Dr. Muhammad Noor. He is a known <laughs> Gowron hater. But other than that, did you love this episode? I did love this episode quite a bit. I thought it was it was excellent. I, the thing that struck me the most, and I agree with the point Sue brought up earlier too, the thing that struck me the most was the dialogue in this episode. Oh my gosh. There's so many good sets of lines, you know, both in terms of just being really moving, but also in terms of just funny things. Like I like the exchange between Esri and Worf with the whole sweet, not a very Klingon word, is it? No. Oh, <laughs> it's so very cute. honorable. <laughs> Better. Be a little obvious. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> it was a little obvious. That was great. Yeah. But like the exchange between Esri and Worf about the denial within the Klingon Empire of itself, amazing. I mean, and it's so true. We can think of that in so many other examples, which we won't go into here, but we can think of a lot of other examples of that around the world. Uh, Relevant today relevant today for sure yeah. as are many things in the show uh the discussion between uh damar and kira about like they're dead they weren't part of this rebellion blah 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 and they're like yeah damar what kind of people <laughs> would give those orders like ooh, oh, that was like gosh. a knife in the heart <laughs> yeah. and actually i like and i like garrick's response to that one garrick's response is like you know if he's the leader we he need him to be him. then he needs to hear these kinds of things mm-hmm. um Tomorrow's comment too, when, when he when he killed Rusat too, like he was my friend, but his Cardassia is dead and it won't be coming back. Mm-hmm. Right. I didn't love the death part to it, but like you know, it seemed like he could have stunned him or something. I don't know. <laughs> it seemed like something else could have happened there. <laughs> but <laughs> still, like it's just the dialogue was amazing, amazing. It just blew me away. But that was that was the thing I took away the most from it. And I did I did think it was very funny the the point that I think it's super up earlier about the female changing sync. If our cloning facilities were operational, I would eliminate this Y unit immediately. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love I Jeffrey Combs' look. Then he's <laughs> <laughs> he almost had y'all on eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I loved it. I actually, this is a case I agree with Super. You know, I, I started for a change. My outfit, <laughs> but I, I really see that this this one like this deserves a ten. I mean, I I would happily give it a ten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, I have to agree. There weren't really any bad scenes or lulls in the episode it didn't feel slow it didn't feel like oh i I hate this plot line um every every plot line was just like delicious yeah Yeah, and that's our boy ronald d moore with that amazing dialogue that we were we were singing his praises earlier love that guy and he doesn't even know i exist Eve England knows we <laughs> exist, though, and she's out in Wales today. How do you feel about this episode? Yeah, I mean, it, it just had so much in it. I, I feel like I need to watch it a couple more times just to really absorb everything. I mean, as everyone has already said, those scenes um, that were sort of commentating on you know, the Klingon Empire and then the Cardassian um, way way of, of, of how they'd managed the, the last 50 years, I just... It was. It, it all seemed to be about, you know, how they people having to come to terms with what the reality of their situation was, and you know that their circumstances had kind of blinded them up until that point about what they were really doing. And as Mohammed said, that that point um, scene with Damar and Kira, 
you know, he, you, you got the sense that he, you know, he really hadn't seen it up until that point, that that's, you know, he is basic, he was doing exactly the same thing as what the founders were doing as part of the occupation. And he, and, and, and then in the same way with um, Esri and Worf, they almost needed that outside perspective to kind of open their eyes to the fact that, you know, because they got caught up in the, in the power, I, I suppose is what happens. And, you know, that is very relevant to how, I suppose, politics and everything kind of works in the real world with us. You know, you have to sort of think that not all of these people who, you know, end up doing bad things are, you know, just evil and doing it deliberately. They just get caught up in that sort of circumstance and the power mm. and the process. So I thought that was just really, that's what sort of struck me from, from the episode is, is how this, you know, you just had these common commentaries on those, you know, big powers that we've been used to seeing. But on terms of the lighter side, what one of my other favorite scenes, I just loved how you just had the relationship between Bashir and O'Brien and those couple of scenes. And you could really just really get the sense that they were best friends. You know, they had that row and Bashir had snapped at um, O'Brien because he was obviously tired. But, you know, O'Brien knows him well enough that they can just come in the next day with some some snacks and everything's fine. And, you know, they're trying to plot the next scheme that they want to get involved with next adventure. So I just thought that was a really nice way of sort of cementing as we're coming to the end, like the relationship mm -hmm. that we've just been we've been following right the way through the seven seasons. So I just thought that was I, I really just that, that was just a nice bit of softness compared to. In my view, it was such a solemn and heavy episode generally. That was just quite nice to sort of see some of that sort of, you know, best friend moments. And I really like that. Yeah, we barely got to talk about that earlier. But one thing I did want to bring up was I thought that was a nice moment. <clears throat> but a really nice touch to that was when Bashir seemed to be really enjoying that crab roll. Like yes. it really seemed like it really yes. seemed like he was touched by it and enjoying it. Like he was really you're going for it you know Sid did a great job there I, I really like that little extra little bit there was it really a crab roll do we know I didn't say <laughs> that, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> all right oh man oh, oh boy oh, everybody's so impossible. mad all of a sudden what happened <laughs> the impossible <laughs> uh Melissa Longo is here. She's focused on a poll, but she just answered it. Our, our question was, who is more ruthless, Kai Wynn or the female changeling? Because we kind of okay. talked about them a little bit earlier. How do you choose? I don't I don't know how to choose between those oh, two. Oh, you just, you click, there's a, there's a button. <laughs> no, what do you think about this episode? I loved this episode so much. I, I and yeah, when... I finished watching it and I watched it twice. Uh, I was I was like, I love Deep Space Nine so much for episodes like this. Um, one, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you guys, um, <laughs> one is um, Kira, Kira, Kira. Hello. <laughs> Kira is amazing in all things and and I really love her chemistry working with the Cardassians um she's really she's really got I don't know what it is about Kira and working with Cardassians but she does it very well there's this definite power struggle but she I don't know I love it. I love those scenes. I love the scenes with her and Rosat <laughs> and um, and her striking a nerve, really hitting a nerve, <laughs> um, and taking him out. <laughs> but um, but I also love her moments with Odo, and it shows such a different side of her. Um, it, it's such a yeah, it's, there's such a tenderness between her and Odo that that I love. And gosh, at the end, I'm just like, oh no, poor, poor Odo. Um, but a couple of things that I learned is that the title of this episode is a nautical reference describing mm -hmm. that when a ship follows um, course correct. Uh, follows a course against the gale and then um, keeps going by making course corrections. And I thought that was kind of very, um, this whole episode, what demonstrated that very well with the Klingons and the Cardassian Empire, 
both Esri said that the Esri said that the Klingon Empire should die in the way that it 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 needs to continue. And then Damar said the Cardassian Empire is dead. That old Cardassia is dead. So they're both making course corrections for the betterment of their species and their cultures, which I thought was amazing. I loved Esri in this, and I felt like this was the first time we saw Esri as Esri and, and settling into the role of Esri with Dax. She's got the wisdom of, of the Dax symbiont with her, but she's also got her own experiences that has influenced Esri up to this point. So it wasn't, I didn't see Curzon or Jadzia when she was advising Worf. I saw Esri and it mm. was wonderful. And, and I loved the advice that she gave him. And, and it was, yeah, this whole episode was so wonderful and so wonderfully done with Bashir's relationship with Julian. And um, yeah, the whole thing was really excellent. Yep. Oh, you're muted, Ryan. Sorry, I'm, I'm still looking at this poll. Everybody's in suspense that was uh, just listening in. Six people said the female changeling is the most ruthless, and seven said, nah, it's Kai Wynn. But let us know uh, your thoughts, everybody, in the comments below. Or don't, totally up to you. Uh, Scott Jensen, what's up, man? Happy promotion day. And what Thanks, do you think about man. this episode? I love this episode. I, I I was just nodding along with Melissa so much because this is this is probably the ultimate Kira that is demonstrated in this episode. Um, mm -hmm. I had made a post about her a while ago. How Kira has become my favorite Star Trek character, not just because of everything she survived and her toughness and and just everything she's been through, but the fact that she heals and becomes a better person by the end of it, and and actually actively attempts to heal. She doesn't just go, this is the way I am. And, and I mean, Kira in, in season six couldn't be helping Garrick. Couldn't be. I was thinking to myself, too, through this whole thing. I'm like, all these scenes that she's got uh, that Nana has with Casey and Andy. And I'm, and I'm going, these three are so great together. And we've seen maybe, what, like 15 minutes of, it, of them all together, this entire series so far. Because mm -hmm. Kira and Garrick don't have a lot of screen time together. And they were just, they were murder Every right. scene that they were in, they were killing it. Particularly, there was one scene that really stuck out to me, and that was when Garrick had just finished talking to Odo, and he's talking to Kira, and just watching Nana's face that entire yeah. time, how she was welling up and then just pulled it all back in and went right back to work, and and she was and it was her voice didn't shake, she didn't do any kind of body movements or anything. It was all just right up here, mm -hmm. and it absolutely blew me away. Uh, once again, uh, there were a couple other things I thought that were really cool. Uh, again, have stuff to do with Kira is that first scene in the very beginning when they're talking about the cells and how you can't know above and be and below the cells can't have connection. And it reminded me of one of my favorite classic sci-fi books. The moon is a harsh mistress by Robert Heinlein. I don't know if anybody else has read that, but it's about a, it's about a revolution on the moon. It's a bunch of people, uh, are the descendants of prisoners because they had made the moon into a prison and a mining colony. And this is years and years later, and they are uh, forming a revolution and a resistance against the overlords and the computers that have taken over human civilization and that kind of thing. And there's a lot of the same talk is very similar, which I think is really cool that hmm. writers knew their stuff when they're talking about resistant cells and just the anonymity of it that you can never turn on people if you don't know who they are up and down so nobody can get tortured for information yeah i love the whole thing and also captain cisco raising his voice to the head of the klingon empire this mm -hmm. dude is the leader yeah. of a warrior civilization and he raises his voice to, to galron and then stares him down until galron leaves not a <laughs> not a bit of sweat on that man's head the entire time just straight stared him down and walked out and I absolutely love that. I can't even go into the Klingon stuff for right beer the rest of the night because good Martok once again. It's too much, too much. So I'm gonna stop it at that. Well, you had it coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Wow. Somebody is psychic here. Matt Boardman unmuted himself right when I was going to uh, call on him because you are next, Matt. It's like he unmuted, but then he's like, well, wait, let's let's see what happens. But no, you were right. <laughs> oh, I have to I have to mute myself because I have my Alexa set every top of every hour to remind me to get up and move. And so I didn't oh, want everybody else to have to share in that. So that's why. <laughs> so uh but yeah, no, this is a great episode. And, you know, there's a mm -hmm. lot of everybody else has made a lot of the same points that that I was thinking as I watched the episode. But just to, so I'm like, OK, what can I say that's that's different that hasn't already been said? But, you know, I think about it, it, this episode, it's it's kind of like the coming to the, a lot of realizations for some of these characters, you know, like Worf, like. I mean, I think about Worf and his journey from Next Generation to now where we're at in Deep Space Nine. And I mean, he was raised by humans and he has always known a Klingon empire that has been very political, less mm -hmm. more warrior race, but more political. I mean, he had a whole thing with having to accept his commendation because of Duras and, and all that, you know, because I just thought, well, whatever, you know, he's off playing playing in the sandbox with the federation he's not going to care but no it's like he it's like his whole life he's he's fought for that like no i am klingon despite the fact that i was raised human no i I'm, I'm klingon and so yeah maybe he's his his vision of the the klingon empire is is romanticized because i mean it's like it's like for myself before i came out to hollywood and and started working out here i just thought you know it was amazing and everybody had you know it was just you know it was something different than what it is and not and that's not to say mm -hmm. that I, I haven't had a whole lot of fun but it's like now that I'm a part of it I see oh wait it's not that romanticized thing that I thought it was when I was living in East Lansing you know and so I think that for Worf that's kind of what he's he's come to this realization you know with the talk with Esri um, and then his friendship with with Gowron uh, you know during the time the, the Duras time and now that it's it's gone and now now he's become friends with Martok it's like as, as they sit there he has he has to come to that realization of like oh yeah you know this is not right it's it's not this thing that I thought it was it's this very political uh body that that's very contrary to the Klingon empire that I believe it to be and so and I, I just thought that whole fight with Gowron was just fantastic. Like that that shot of Worf crashing through the glass, you know, that reverse angle there as he crashes through the glass. And then, you know, Gowron and he comes up with with the broken pieces of bat left into to Gowron. That was that was so good. Um, let's see, what else do I love about this episode? I I one of the the relationships that I don't think really got explored a whole lot but I loved was the relationship between Odo and Garrick which we got introduced to in in season three with the the two-parter it was an improbable cause and the die is cast mm -hmm. and like because there was a great there was a great episode after that you know they go through that whole incident together and I think that kind of establishes a little bit of rapport between the two and there's that great episode afterwards where they're sitting at the replimat and and Odo's got that cup that he keeps refilling with himself you know <laughs> so, <laughs> i think it's great um but i love that little interchange between the two of them because it kind of reminds you it's like oh yeah there's you know obviously there's some behind the scenes uh interactions between the two of them and and for garrick to like genuinely you can tell garrick genuinely has feelings for odo when he says odo you have my and odo's like look if i don't want to hear it from the woman that i love I don't want to hear it from you right you know so that that was great um i love that uh martok comes from these humble beginnings and he just i mean he i think he he sells himself short in a lot of ways like he's just he's like i'm just there to do my job right you know i'm a soldier of the empire i you know but he's what he doesn't realize is that yeah you're just a soldier of the empire but you're really good at what you do mm. and and i think one of the great things about Worf is that he sees that, you know, he sees that, um, that Martok has this greatness. And so it was like, it was never a question for Worf that Martok is the one that should take over after that. And then the last thing I just, I love the, the music of Star Trek. Um, this one was scored by David Bell 
And I just, I don't know, there's something about David Bell's music, like, like, I always associate the Dominion War arc with his, you know, he's always has the, the heavy horns and, you know, the French horns and those harmonies and stuff like that. And it's, I don't know, it's one of those that I catch myself, at, you know, just tooling around the house or whatever, and I'm, I'm humming those tunes <laughs> or, I'll, you know, so yeah, great music, great mm-hmm. dialogue, Ron Moore always brings his A game, especially when the Klingons are involved. Um there's an episode of, of Voyager, Barge of the Dead. You know, I, I, I remember watching mm. that episode and I was like, man, this episode feels so familiar. It was like, it was like a warm blanket in a way, despite the fact that we're dealing with dead Klingon rituals and whatever. But, and then I saw who wrote it. I was like, nope, there's Ron Moore. So yeah, always brings his A game when he does uh, episodes regarding Klingons. Mm-hmm. We do love us some Ronald D. This mm. guy is amazing. Um all right. Mai is live from Tokyo. Mai, your thoughts today. Good morning. Good morning, the, uh, everybody. Um, yeah, same as everybody. It's a total mind sync with what everybody's saying. Um, loved Ed's comments right at the top. That was amazing. Um, and Melissa, you, you stole my comments. I think you're reading what, what I wanted to say. Um, the uh, tacking into the wind what a great title the writers just absolutely killed it this time mm. um, it, it, that title seems to be just very much about Damar because he's trying to figure mm. out how to get his what he's doing to go forward and and the the the, the little blurb they had in the in the memory alpha was talking about going into a gate turning into the gale they didn't they didn't talk about how I've got a friend who actually just bought a catamaran and, and sailed up from Cape Town to Grenada, where he's just gotten about a week ago. And along the way, I listened to a lot of the talk that he was saying. He, he talked about this because these big, uh, tall sailed catamarans and, and other similar boats have got these sails which turn to the side and they move forward much better when the wind is coming from the side. So mm-hmm. there's this zigzag sort of thing that they do to go forward. And that tacking into the wind where they have to take the bow of the boat and they have to go across the wind to get to go in the other direction, it's, it's, it really speaks to what Damar was doing with this. And and I forget who mentioned it with the with the and his his Cardassia's dead comment. That was just bang on. He he really is moving forward with what he needs to get mm-hmm. done. I loved everything about what the writers did with the title. Um, I thought it was fantastic. I, the comments about Garrick being a sentimental supporter first with Odo and then with Kira. I, fantastic stuff. I mean, but question though, and I think maybe who's the other Lord of the Rings aficionado? Eric Faith, is that you? Faith um, and myself. I think that and might be Brian, anybody else. Did Peter Jackson Tierney's model Shagrat? Did, Mo, did Peter Jackson model Shagrat after Odo after after Odo lying on the floor going? Ah. It just looked <laughs> so much a like bad hair day. Wow. Yeah. Um, hair was a mess. So the, yeah, that, that was and and the manipulation a la Dax as as Anil pointed out at the top. Um, Ezri was was fantastic. Old soul, young person, just great. She brought in some some great mm-hmm. stuff there. Uh, what else? Uh, Worf with his Shakespeare. That was hilarious. I'd forgotten about that. I was cracking up. Uh, listen, yeah. and, then, and then Kira with her acting. My God. Oh. Visitor just, just absolutely nailed it every step of the way. The, when she did the, um, the Luaran, uh, when she put the headset on and, and did that, and she went from the very angry, very focused uh, Kira out on a campaign pissed off about helping the Cardassians in the first place, but really focused to this sweet, kind Luaran. And then she comes back. There we go. There we go. That's, that's, um, that's comes back harsh. to, um, <laughs> the, the, it goes, goes sweet and then goes back to, to being the very focused uh, Kira at the, at the end. I thought, wow, what great acting. And, ah. and I know we had Kitty on earlier. So as an homage to that lipstick color, same as Luaran for that. I wanted nice. to go with that today. Right. Um, and I, I can't uh, I can't end this without a bit of a, a, a bit of an uh, homage to to the dear departed departed Gowron. So, Matt, um, mm-hmm. another song for you. What? What? <laughs> Did you say another Did you song? song? Oh, there it is. I see. Over my shoulder. Hang on. I'm going to spotlight you. One more time. But we're not hearing it. No. Ah, 
don't know if the sound is coming through, but it's the soundtrack I put Bob O'Reilly on there because it's farewell to Bob O'Reilly. Oh, <laughs> we do love Bob. Yes. What did, what was his last, last words, his dying words uh, when Gal Ronnie said, you, you will not have, have this day, day, I think. This day. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was wrong. This is just a great episode. This, this episode, I give it a solid 11. Absolutely. Turn it all the way up. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Very nice. All right. Tierney C. Diekman is an 11 herself, and she's got something to say. Let's hear it. I always have far too much to say. We know this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I have to. Uh, my notes echo so much of what everyone is saying. Uh, Melissa, like, just nailed like half of what I have written down <sighs> about um, uh, Kira in particular. <sighs> just wow and i mean i have said it in the past few episodes for the ending arc and i haven't been able to be around for a few of the others in this but i probably would have said it for them too i'm iffy on these last few probably just from watching it too much i I, it it just doesn't it doesn't hit me it just it doesn't and there's a number of reasons for that until this one I started started this one up and finally felt engaged again and i'm very happy for that and and really wanted to sit there and feel it and you do you really do with everything that's going on between the dialogue the performances and you can you can see where the writers it felt like they cared more. There's more in it. And I don't know if they, if you look at some of the information, they kind of had to change things around to fit the previous and the uh, continuing episode to make everything work. And maybe that was good. The limitations they had to put on themselves brought more creativity into it is, is a thing that happens. It sometimes works out better when you only have so much to work with, uh, brings in more ingenuity and it shows. Um, and, and actually in one, uh, in one bit, and I'd have to go back and really look and maybe look in the future too. notice it very much with the uh, cinematography when they're on uh, the, when they're on the ship, the, the, uh, the Dominion ship, and they're waiting for the brain mm-hmm. weapon to be installed. And she's gone into Lauren mode and, that whole scene is going on. The camera is a little bit shaky cam. It's like you're in the ship with them. You can feel it. You can feel the tension build as everything's going on. And as soon as that's over and the scene switches, camera's smooth again and you relax. Hmm, interesting. I wouldn't have noticed it before if I wasn't paying that much attention, but you do. And, uh, you know, I wonder if this is something that's been utilized before to build tension, but I really noticed it this time because I was really, really looking at this one. But then um, just what I absolutely love, I will say, starting here and towards the end is that full extent of the characterization and then the relationship of Kira, Odo, Garrick, and Damar. I don't know what it is. Maybe just because everybody, every single one of them has been through so much of their own personal hells that they've had to grow and learn and change that they work so well together. And this episode in particular for Kira's character, we're really finally seeing the full extent of everything that she is and we couldn't get that without nana she friggin nails this yeah and we see you know her training as a terrorist as a military officer with her love and sensitivities with her relationship with odo uh, and her respect for him as well with his illness and what he's going through and how he feels with it um 
and the dissonance that she's facing between her past and her loyalties towards what's happening now towards herself or personal loyalties and just what needs to be done. And Nana gives it this realism of what, how much a person can balance all of that and how much they can contain what emotions they can keep and what just comes out because there's going to be leaks that spring here and there that any real life person just sometimes can't, can't control. Like when she goes off on Rusat and beats the crap out of him, like she did to Damar at one point before he learned, before he grew and understood that his Cardassia was dead. And then when she let that out on him of, yeah, Damar, what kind of people do that? And with that, we were also seeing more of Garrick. We, I think we got a little bit more of his character's extent through um, the claustrophobia, the, the tortures that he himself went through, and that his loyalties lie with himself. They're not really with Cardassia. They're with what sort of works with Garrick. And then as Cardassia changes, he kind of does too. And he sees that, you see that with him in, again, that moment with Rusat and Damar, and he's uh, he, he's pointing, you know, the weapon at Kira and Odo, and 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 Garrick's just like, don't, don't think you know me just because I'm Cardassian. Do you think my loyalties lie with you just because we're the same race, really? And there's all of those, there's all of those complexities there. But um, moving on from that, there were a couple of uh, deleted scenes, or I don't know if they were deleted or just they didn't film them. Um, but one, uh, one really great one, apparently, was uh, that there was that lovely little speech with Esri and Worf. But um, at one point, apparently, Esri says to Worf something along the lines of, how did it feel to be chancellor for a moment? You know, how did it feel? Michael Dorn had commented on it. You know, she says, how does it feel to be up on the mountaintop? You know, what were you thinking? And he had said that he, he wished that his father had been there. He thought of his father and that he wished he could see him as chancellor, if only for a moment. And Esri says, I think he was there, as was Jadzia. And they would have been proud and, you know, raises a toast to says to Chancellor Worf and they they drink together. And Michael Dorn points out that it was just this riveting moment. And it's so sad that they had to apparently cut it for time. But just seeing little things like that at the end where all of these characters come together and we do get a lot more of Esri as Esri, not Esri trying to make up for what Jadzia used to be and her having this full understanding of the Klingon Empire and Worf respecting her counsel on the fact that this is, this is an empire that's essentially in a suicide dive. It's not going to go anywhere. It's, it's, it's just, it's not. And everybody's been seeing this in Klingon politics for years, but they're also swayed by the romanticism. We're seeing this now, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> we don't, we don't need to comment any further on that, but uh, it just, God damn this episode. This has revitalized me again <laughs> for... <laughs> I hate to say it for the end, but yeah. mm -hmm. it. There, there were two versions of that deleted scene. Uh, the other go. answer that Worf gave was that he wished Alexander was there so he can see how much more of a loser he is <laughs> compared to his father. I thought you were being serious for a second. Damn it, Sarag. <laughs> Come on, Aww. you gotta know better. <laughs> you know, Worf doesn't think about <laughs> Alexander. Poor kid. Love it. Poor kid. I wish we could have seen that deleted scene, though. Either version. 
That would have been good stuff. <laughs> Worf just shitting on Alexander. <laughs> yeah, he's got it coming. One last time. It's season Our seven. Get it out never had, had a chance. And his but mud did, He did not have a chance. Never Worf had a chance. For, for all of his wonder for, yeah. failure qualities. from the beginning. He was a crap father. <laughs> well, somebody that also loves mud bass almost as much as Alexander is Carrie Schwent here. How you doing, Carrie? <laughs> With Gowron eyes can. behind you. <laughs> can't, you can't ever say I've taken a mud bath, but <laughs> we yes. have to get we have to get Ryan a segue, a seventh rule segue <laughs> for yeah. all the segues that you right? <laughs> <laughs> Random segues. I can't be held responsible for all the dumb crap I say, please. <laughs> Seriously. Anyway, please continue. <laughs> That's Barry. why we love you, Ryan. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, rip, yeah, rip Gowron, and this is my favorite picture of Odo, Odo and Kira. And I today I actually came up with their couple name. They are Odira. Okay. I don't know if anybody's oh, ever come up with that dear. before, but I love it. Odira. Oh dear. I like yeah, I like mashing up people's names. It's fun. Hey, knock it off, guys. Cats are. It's that time of day they start hissing <laughs> at each other. <laughs> they're re they're ready to eat, but they can wait. <laughs> but I will start off with my haiku, and then I've got some all, all kinds of feels to, to go through. But to oh. start off with, we've got <laughs> Odo is getting worse. Martok is the new chancellor. Miles hatches a plan. And yeah, my, the, the little, just that little bit of sneaking in of just the two of them just simply sets things up for, 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 next, for next time. And I just, I love all the feels of every every kind in the episode. Everybody's got depth of feeling of one kind or another for somebody. Seeing seeing Garrick react, to seeing Oda lay, laying in the, in the bed like that, just only time I've ever seen that expression on him. And it just, that, that gets you in the feels. And then he's like, yeah, I don't want Kira to, to know he he loves her that much he doesn't want her to know how much he's suffering but then when garrett goes to her he he sees the the depth of love that she has for odo i already know but it's going to help him to pre to pretend for me to pretend that i that i don't know and just i love just how much how just every scene with them together just gets here just all kinds of in the feels and with with the 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 feels with with Damar. And I think it was Matt. I can't remember exactly what he said, but I I wrote it I wrote it down afterwards that sometimes the things we need to hear the most are often the hardest to mm -hmm. hear. We we need we need to hear them, but sometimes hearing that is not pleasant. There's nothing for it, but the only way out is through. Like and... your alarm clock. <laughs> I don't know. No, I, don't I think know uh, so I've, I've heard somebody say, T tell me what I need to know, not what I want to hear or something like that. Yeah. I've heard it said like that before. Yeah. Just all kinds of, all kinds of stuff there. But then there's all of the, the little bits of humor put put in through that were great. The that little bit with that with Ezra and Worf, like yeah, you're being cheesy, but yeah, you're right. But yeah, that you could have come up with something better. But I'll finish with my absolute favorite scene with Cisco just letting Galron have it, and Galron <laughs> being being all like petulant kid that yo yo okay you did this. What do you have to say about it? Well. And then Gowron's like, well, he's gonna be okay. Just that his facial expression and the way he said that just is absolutely my favorite part of the entire episode. Probably my favorite <laughs> line of Gowron's period. Hmm. I just love that this whole time you've had Gowron just staring a hole in us <laughs> right over <laughs> your shoulder. <laughs> yeah. The only Gowron can do. His Those eyes are, are fantastic. My husband can actually do Gowron oh, wow. eyes like that. Yeah, he'll, I'll have to. I'll have to get him on to show you 
sometime, but his employee picture at work, his eyes are like this, like this big. It's yeah, uh-huh, like that. <laughs> and every time I point it out, he leans in at me like that and does just what you did throughout, just to just to make <laughs> me roll my eyes and laugh. <laughs> yeah. Well, Such when I mentioned episode. when I mentioned the mud bath earlier, Faith was actually nodding as if I was gonna say her. So maybe maybe Faith, you're the the mud bath person. <laughs> I have not. However, yeah. we do we did have a mud festival in Korea when I was there that I always kind of wanted to go to. Oh. Except as you may have noticed, I'm very fair skinned, and the idea of being in any kind of sun at any point is kind of scary. So yeah, I never partook, but I always thought I might like to try. So apparently it's supposed to be really good for your skin. So. Mm-hmm. Well, you so, know, it also um, good for your skin. This awesome episode. How'd you feel about it? Did you love it? Did it make you laugh or cry? I love this whole arc. So, you know, I love how the, the writers are really pulling us together at this point and everything's getting more and more tense as the the war builds up to that end point um, that we, I guess, all know is coming, right? That's not a spoiler at this point. Um, especially, of course, the Damar arc. And I love how they added Rusat and he's such a butt. I don't, he's just, <laughs> he's so fun to hate. And um, I love how, you know, you know, that picture right behind you that Kira just grabs him and gives him gives him what Demar probably deserved long ago it's romantic and <laughs> so, um, it's like- yeah and I I also love how the writers are so <laughs> adept at sprinkling in background for characters with just a line or two like we added a whole family for Demar unfortunately you know kind of sad the way they got added as they also exited the story but um I, I love that that adds a whole depth to his character and, and, you know, you can think back on things he's been doing and wow, that's a whole different light and a lot of things. And that girl that he was hanging out with, was that his wife? Was it not his wife? We don't know. I'm going to believe one way for, you know, my love for him, but um, you know, I'll leave that there. Um, I also, um, a- as I mentioned before, I remember watching this when it first aired and I remember being really surprised when they killed Gowron because it was very well known that peripheral characters like that that were named like the Duras sisters um if they got cast in a movie they were going to get it so it's unusual for a character like that that has been in for so long and especially on two series I feel like to be killed on screen and so um, I remember very being very surprised, but I also really love how they had Worf do it so that it wasn't Galra or wasn't um, Martok that killed him. Right. And so that kind of protects the integrity of the character. But then he didn't he didn't keep the power either. He passed it on. And so I thought that was really poetic in that dynamic there. And, and it kind of spoke to the respect that Worf has for Martok as well. And then one tiny little nitpick from that scene, um, child's uniform, excuse me, this whole show <laughs> is about that uniform. So um, you know, we've been talking about Star Trek insults a lot lately in different corners. So um, yeah, I just, uh, of all the insults that are out there, that one kind of hits me funny. <laughs> that's the one <laughs> all right uh all right well that's about it for us Srock, do you have any uh final thoughts on this i feel like we only covered like half this episode there was so much in here right <laughs> yeah this episode has so much stuff it's really hard to cover it all it makes you feel a roller coaster of emotions when you watch it because there's so many good scenes um and good pairings of people that are just uh you know immensely great actors mm-hmm. um number one i would say I, I you know the easiest thing that i can find as a cure for what odo is going through is lotion and i don't know why because <laughs> that skin ashy. is so dry every time <laughs> i see that that little peeling piece i'm like just peel that little piece off bro i mean you know he's so sad you can't just let you can't let that flake just sit there you got to 
flake that off. Um, <laughs> little shea butter. You add it little shea later. butter. Little, yeah, cocoa butter. Some Vaseline. <laughs> yeah, something. He needs he needs a facial. Um, no, uh, I don't know if any of you thought about Mr. T, but I did when, uh, you know, don't pity the fool. Don't pity the fool. <laughs> I was waiting for Mr. T to pop up out of that little scene. Um, and um, I, I thought that Kira showed a lot of restraint and growth in the moment where she offended DeMar when he lost his family. Normally, she would get her kicks off on just zinging one off on a Cardassian and just, you know, making sure she she's pretty good at... Uh, throwing her, her jabs at the Cardassians, especially when it came to Dukat and even Damar in the past, she's really given him, a, you know, but this time she took no pleasure in it. And I thought that was a, a lot of, it was growth in her, you know, she, and that just shows that even, uh, even your worst enemies, there's, there's times in which it's, it's not appropriate mm. to say or do certain things. There's like a certain etiquette there that, you know, you don't kick somebody when they're down there, you know, um, or you allow their loved ones to bury them within peace and you don't, you know, defile the, the ceremony of their, uh, uh, you know, of their demise. But I just think that uh, that showed a lot of growth on Kira's part. The fact that she actually felt like she shouldn't have said that um, has come a long way for her because she's normally doesn't care. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, um, do whatever it takes, Mr. War, Cisco says. And yeah. I really believed him when he said it. I thought that was a great delivery on Cisco's part. He, he kind of like let it be known. And as soon as he said that, I was like, oh, Galron, you're dead. You're a dead man. It's not going to work out for you <laughs> because Cisco's pretty much given the orders. Um, but that do whatever it takes kind of reminds me of everybody's outlook in this particular episode you, you've got the resistance cell doing whatever it takes to try to you know stop uh the dominion um you've got odo doing whatever it takes to hide and conceal his illness and the, the severity of his illness from kira um you've got damar doing whatever it takes including killing his own friend because it was standing in the way of uh a free Cardassia. Yep. Um, and so you've got all of these characters really doing whatever it takes. Uh, even Garrick, um, you know, you know, he, he's unscrupulous, so you never know what he's going to do. But even he took a, the moment of confidence and kind of private moment that he had with Odo and uh, said, I have to tell Kira, right? So he, he did what it took, even though he could have kept it private he still felt like it was necessary to tell her. So he was doing whatever he thought it took to, um, you know, make everybody aware of what was going on and what kind of odds they were facing. So I just think that everybody was really forced in a position where there was kind of a, you know, you have to make a choice type of moment about going forward and, and having a new understanding about where we are going forward and demarth has taken leaps and bounds as far as his growth um wharf showed me a lot of growth in this episode he's usually a follow orders kind of guy but he kind of uh went stepped outside of his normal to you know shake up the system so um just a lot of stuff in this episode i thought this was just jam-packed with too many good things i loved all the moments with uh O'Brien and uh, Bashir. I think their friendship is genuine. Yeah. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, Ezri and Worf had great moments. Uh, Wei Yun's uh, performances with the founder, when, when there's a three way conversation between Wei Yun, the founder, and then the Breen are standing there, I love Wei Yun's reactions to the Breen when he looks at him like, how dare you say that or something? <laughs> when we know there was no really words transpired, but Wei Yun's reactions register as if there were. So it's, it's, it's just 
fantastic acting all across the board. And also Mike Behar, who directed this, I think he did a really good job of focusing in on the eyes and really getting a lot of the uh, emotion and feelings inside the eyes. I just kept feeling the capture of eyes, Cisco's eyes, G uh, Galron's eyes, Garrick's eyes, Odo's yeah. eyes. Kira had a moment where, I mean, just her eyes were lighting up, lighting up the screen and were telling so much emotion that she was holding back. And it was just, it was just so much written in the eyes and uh, kudos to Ron Moore for giving us so much material that these actors can even convey stuff that's not even on the script just through looks. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just, just a fantastic episode. Love it. Ciroc dropping the lotion knowledge. That is a first for us on the seventh <laughs> rule. That big old chunk on Odo's face. That was the biggest flake we've seen on Deep Space Nine since Marta flaked on Jake Sisko. Am I right? Oh, uh, right. yeah. <laughs> 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 all right. Uh, that's go. all we have. Uh, she became this a chef. Week, yeah. Um, By the way, I don't know what's going to happen uh, after this. I'll, obviously, you guys know more than I do. But there was a moment, and this is my own, like, I, I feel like they're telegraphing this. There was a moment when the founder said that, tell me when the replicators are back online, where I felt like Wei Yun sensed his own mortality and almost felt like yeah. he's going to act on the fact that he, he's up on the chopping block. So I don't know what's going to happen next. This is me just telling you what I felt like was being given away in the performance uh, yeah. by Jeffrey Combs. So I don't know what's happening, but I do feel like Wayun is in a predic predicament where he may have the option to uh defect let's say well they're raising the stakes for everybody right it's getting mm -hmm. closer yeah. and closer we saw three people die galron and a couple other characters that were a little less big but i mean they're the whole show is raising the stakes this is it this this is your and little indians yeah this is yeah. your signal that uh the show's about to end when people start dying or their mortality starts getting closer all right cool my Thanks very much for playing with us today. You too, Ed, Sue, Muhammad, Eve, Melissa, Gold, Scott. We're not sure about you. Matt Boardman, <laughs> Anil, Tierney, Carrie, and Faith. We appreciate all of you and everybody at home. We appreciate you too. Keep the conversation going in the comments below if you want. And other than that, Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again soon on The Seventh Rule. Always remember it. Bye, Homer. Bye, Homer. <laughs> <laughs>